Mr. Jacob, you were there, seeing that for the first time. Does it surprise you to see how close the mob was to the evacuation route that you took? The 40 feet is the distance from me to you, roughly. I could hear the din of the rioters in the building while we moved, but I don't think I was aware that they were as close as that. Make no mistake about the fact that the vice president's life was in danger. A recent court filing by the Department of Justice explains that a confidential informant from the Proud Boys told the FBI that the Proud Boys would have killed Mike Pence if given a chance. This witness, whom the FBI affidavit refers to as W1, stated that other members of the group talked about things they did that day, and they said that anyone they got their hands on, they would have killed, including Nancy Pelosi. W1 further stated that members of the Proud Boys said that they would have killed Mike Pence if given a chance. We understand that congressional leaders and others were evacuated from the Capitol complex during the attack. We'd like to show you what happened after the vice president was evacuated from the Senate. The Select Committee has obtained never before seen photos from the National Archives that show Vice President Pence sheltering in a secure underground location as rioters overwhelmed the Capitol. At 4.19 p.m., Vice President Pence is seen looking at a tweet the president had just sent, a tweet asking the rioters to leave the Capitol. After four and a half hours spent on working to restore order, the vice president returned to the Senate floor to continue the certification of electors. So Vice President Pence was a focus of the violent attack. Mr. Jacob, did the vice president leave the Capitol complex during the attack? He did not. Can you please explain why the vice president refused to leave the Capitol complex? When we got down to the secure location, Secret Service directed us to get into the cars, um, which I did. Um, and then I noticed that the vice president had not. So I got out of the car that I had gotten, in, gotten into, um, and I understood that the vice president had refused to get into uh, the car. Um, the, the head of his Secret Service detail, Tim, had said, I assure you we're not going to drive out of the building without your permission. And the vice president had said something to the effect of, Tim, I know you, I trust you, but you're not the one behind the wheel. And the vice president did not want to take any chance that um, the world would see the vice president of the United States fleeing the United States Capitol. He was determined that we would complete the work that we had um, set out to do that day, that it was his constitutional duty to see through, um, and that the rioters who had breached the Capitol would not have the satisfaction of um, disrupting the proceedings beyond the day on which they were supposed to be completed. Let me see if I understand this right. You were told to get in the cars, and how many of the vice president's staff got in the cars while well, he did not? Most of us. During our investigation, we received testimony that while the vice president was in a secure location within the Capitol complex, he continued the business of government. We understand that the Vice President reached out to congressional leaders, like the Acting Secretary of Defense and others, to check on their safety and to address the growing crisis. In addition, the Vice President's Chief of Staff, Mark Short, made several calls to senior government officials. Here's Mr. Short's testimony regarding his call with Representative Kevin McCarthy. He indicated that uh... He had had some conversation. I don't recall whether it was the, with the president or with somebody at the White House, but I think he he expressed uh, frustration that uh, um, not taking the circumstances as seriously as they should in that moment. All right. So Mr. McCarthy indicated he'd been in touch with someone at the White House, and he conveyed to you that they weren't taking this as seriously as they should. You have, yes. to, you have to answer yes, yes. or no? Yes. Okay. While the vice president made several calls to check on the safety of others, it was his own life that was in great danger. 
Mr. Jacob, did Donald Trump ever call the vice president to check on his safety? He did not. Mr. Jacob, how did Vice President Pence and Mrs. Pence react to that? With frustration. Mr. Jacob, immediately before you and the Vice President were evacuated to a secure location within the Capitol, you hit send on an email to John Eastman explaining why his legal theory about the Vice President's role was wrong. You ended your email by stating that, quote, thanks to your bullshit, we are now under siege. We'll take a look at that email. Now, Dr. Eastman replied, and this is hard to believe, but his reply back to you was, the siege is because you and your boss, presumably referring to the Vice President of the United States, did not do what was necessary to allow this to be aired in a public way so the American people can see for themselves what happened. Mr. Jacob, later that day, you wrote again to Dr. Eastman. Let's show that email on the screen. In that email, you wrote, and I quote, did you advise the president that in your professional judgment, the vice president does not have the power to decide things unilaterally. And you ended that email saying, it does not appear that the president ever got the memo. Dr. Eastman then replied, he's been so advised. And he ends his email with, quote, but you know him, once he gets something in his head, it's hard to get him to change course, close quote. Mr. Jacob, when Dr. Eastman wrote, once he gets something in his head, it's hard to get him to change course, did you understand the he in that email to refer to the President of the United States? I did. Uh, and Mr. Jacob, did you hear from Dr. Eastman further after the riot had been quelled? And if so, what did he ask? Late that evening, after the joint session had been reconvened, um, the Vice President had given a statement to the nation saying that violence was not going to win, freedom wins, um, and that the people were going to get back to doing their work. Um, later that evening, um, Mr. Eastman emailed me to point out that, in his view, the Vice President's speech uh, to the nation um, violated the Electoral Count Act that the Electoral Count Act had been violated because the debate on Arizona had not been completed in two hours. Um, of course, it couldn't be since there was an intervening riot of several hours. Um, <clears throat> and that the speeches that the majority and minority leaders had been allowed to make also violated the Electoral Count Act because they hadn't been counted against the debate time. And then he implored me, now that we have established that the Electoral Count Act um, isn't so sacrosanct as you have made it out to be. I implore you one last time, can the Vice President please do what we've been asking him to do these last two days, suspend the joint session, send it back to the states. And we'll show you the text of that email, which Dr. Eastman wrote at 11.44 p.m. on January 6th. So after the attack on the Capitol and after law enforcement had secured the Capitol, he still wrote, as you described, quote, so now that the precedent has been set that the Electoral Count Act is not quite so sacrosanct as was previously claimed, I implore you to consider one more relatively minor violation and adjourn for 10 days to allow the legislatures to finish their investigations. So even after the attack on the Capitol had been quelled, Dr. Eastman requested, in writing no less, that the Vice President violate the law by delaying the certification and sending the question back to the states. Is that correct, Mr. Jacob? It is. Did you eventually share Dr. Eastman's proposal with Vice President Pence? Uh not right at that time, because the Vice President was completing uh, the work um, that it was his duty to do. But a day or two later, back at the White House, I did show him the 
um, that final email from Mr. Eastman. And what was Vice President Pence's reaction when you showed him the email where Dr. Eastman, after the attack on the Capitol, still asked that the Vice President delay certification and send it back to the states? He said, that's rubber room stuff. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Wood. He said it's rubber room stuff? Yes, Congressman. What did you interpret that to mean? I understood it to mean that after having seen play out um, what happens when you convince people that there is a decision to be made in the Capitol legitimately about who is to be the president and the consequences of that, that he was still pushing us to do uh, what uh, he had been asking us to do for the previous two days, that that was certifiably crazy. We know that the Vice President did not do what Dr. Eastman requested because he presided over the completion of the counting of electoral votes late in that evening. The number of electors appointed to vote for President of the United States is 538. Within that whole number, a majority is 270. The votes for President of the United States are as follows. Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware has received 306 votes. Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida has received 232 votes. The whole number of electors appointed to vote for Vice President of the United States is 538. Within that whole number, a majority is 270. The votes for Vice President of the United States are as follows. Kamala D. Harris of the state of California has received 306 votes. Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana has received 232 votes. The announcement of the state of the vote by the President of the Senate shall be deemed a sufficient declaration of the person's elected President and Vice President of the United States, each for the term beginning on the 20th day of January 2021, and shall be entered together with the list of the votes on the journals of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Mr. Jacob, we heard earlier that you and the Vice President and the team started January 6 with a prayer. You faced a lot of danger that day. And this is a personal question. But how did your faith guide you on January 6th? Um, my faith really sustained me through it. Um, I, down in the secure location, um, pulled out my Bible. Um, read through it, um, and uh, just took great comfort. Um, Daniel 6 uh, was where I went, and um, in Daniel 6, uh, Daniel has become the second in command of Babylon, a pagan nation, but he completely faithfully serves. He refuses an order from the king that he cannot follow, and he does his duty um, in cons consistent with his oath to God. And I felt that that's what had played out that day. It spoke to you? Yes. At the end of the day, Mark Short sent the vice president a text message with a Bible verse. Here's what he told the select committee. At 3.50 in the morning, when we finally adjourned and headed our own ways, I remember you know, texting the vice president a, a passage from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, about, um, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. With a prayer, and ended his day with a Bible verse. I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith.